Saved on Grounds, Slavery at the University of Virginia. Our program this afternoon is brought to you by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello and the Office of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia. My name is John Ragosta. I'm a historian here at the International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. And we're pleased today to have with us Justine Hill Edwards from the History Department at UVA. She's an expert on African-American history, especially the history of slavery and capitalism. Her first book is due out from Columbia University this spring, Unfree Markets, The Slave Economy and the Rise of Capitalism in South Carolina. Justine has her PhD from Princeton University, and some of our viewers will be familiar with Justine from her work this past summer on the Summer Jefferson Symposium. And we're looking forward to today's program. Justine? Thank you, John, for the introduction. I'd like to start with just a few names. Dinah, Zachariah, Sharper, and Ben, Bob, Polly, Wyatt, and Lewis. These are just a few of the enslaved people whose labor was crucial to building what we know today as the University of Virginia. There's also one more name I'd like to include on this list, and that is Isabella Gibbons. Gibbons was born enslaved in 1835. University professors William Rogers and Francis H. Smith owned her, and she worked as a cook, serving Smith, Rogers, and the, and the UVA students from 1853 to 1863. She was also literate and she put her skills to good use upon her emancipation in 1863. As a prominent member of the Charlottesville community, she taught recently emancipated African Americans how to read and write at the Freedmen School in Charlottesville until she died in 1889. Her words are forever enshrined in the University of Virginia's recently completed Memorial to the Enslaved Laborers. Here's what she wrote. Can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping post, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trader tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten that by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? No, we have not or ever will. This is a letter from Gibbons wrote in 1867 and these words are forever inscribed in the memorial. We are fortunate to have a record of her amazing, amazing life. The type of work that she did was crucial to the functioning of the University of Virginia during its early years. Fortunately for us, we know her history. Unfortunately though, there are many more enslaved laborers whose names and experiences will probably never be uncovered. The memorial to the enslaved laborers that you see here is a public recognition of the contributions that enslaved men and women made to the University of Virginia. Approximately 4,000 enslaved individuals built, worked at, and lived on grounds. This means that slavery was an integral and an indelible component of the University of Virginia during its first 40 years of existence. So this afternoon, I'm going to discuss the experiences of these enslaved people. These enslaved people who helped fulfill Jefferson's vision, his grand vision, of the academical village. So in this way, I'm going to briefly explore the history of UVA from the ground up or from the perspective of the enslaved. There are few vestiges of the lives of enslaved people who lived at the University of Virginia. Despite that, there are glimpses in the archival record that illuminate the many ways in which enslaved men and women contributed to UVA's rich history. This topic offers us an opportunity, really, to grapple with Jefferson's fundamental complexities. In particular, the relationship between his ideas about democracy and his support of slavery. Slavery was, indirectly, a core component of the liberal arts education that Jefferson designed. Though students learned about philosophy and math, modern languages, and moral philosophy, 
They were surrounded by and interacted every day with bondsmen and bondswomen. And in many ways, the experiences of the enslaved laborers prove this exact point. Slaves were both seen and unseen. They were visible on grounds when the labor was necessary for the building, maintenance, and functioning of the university. They were visible in the dining halls, in the libraries, but until recently, the history of enslaved people at the University of Virginia has been relegated to the shadows. Over the past several years, a very diligent group of students, faculty, and administrators have dug into the university's archive. They have uncovered the lives of the enslaved women and men who worked to construct and lived at one of the nation's most prestigious public universities. This memorial to the enslaved laborers is a visible testament to their dedication. So again, this afternoon, I'm going to give a bit of context really to the experiences of the enslaved individuals who helped to construct and helped UVA function. Building on the years of hard work by those who imagined and built the memorial and those who served on the President's Commission on Slavery and the University, this question that I'm going to consider today is this, how did enslaved people contribute to and experience the University of Virginia in the years between its founding in 1817 and the end of the Civil War in 1865? So upon finishing his term as president in 1809, Jefferson returned to Charlottesville and envisioned his next project. And that project was building a public university to educate members of the voting populace, one comprised primarily of white property owning men. He believed and he advocated for the benefits of a liberal arts education. Between 1809 and 1817, Jefferson worked to garner not only political but economic support to construct a university with these grand goals in mind. And construction began on then what was known as Central College in July 1817 with 10 enslaved men, or hands as they were called. These bondsmen began the difficult work of clearing and preparing the land for construction. Later that year, in October 1817, the Board of Visitors, which was the college's governing body, approved the hiring of enslaved laborers to level the grounds and complete other necessary work. This means that the initial work of clearing and preparing the land for construction was completed by enslaved laborers hired by the university. And enslaved people were hired out or rented out to help construct the pavilions and the hotels, which were buildings that housed students and faculty and the buildings in which students took their classes. I'll talk uh, in a few minutes about this history and this practice of slave hiring and slave renting. So the university underwent construction between 1817 and 1825, and enslaved laborers worked alongside free blacks and white laborers, and they were building the literal foundations of Jefferson's educational goals. Again, initially named Central College, the institution was, giving an, was given an official state charter to become the University of Virginia in January 1825, a mere two months before the first students arrived to grounds. And here at UVA, we have a particular vocabulary when it comes to the student experience, and grounds is what we call the university campus. Interestingly enough, the architectural design of the academical village, including the pavilions and the hotels, was the brainchild of Jefferson. He endeavored to create an insular educational community and to keep the enslaved laborers hidden from public view. Their living arrangements were away from where the students lived, which goes to the idea that the enslaved laborers were both seen and unseen during, during UVA's first 40 years. To be clear, slavery was as much a part of UVA as was Jefferson's idea of creating an insular community of students and professors. His vision, however, would not have been fulfilled 
without the contributions of the enslaved workers, the men and women who built the buildings, served the professors, and ultimately maintained grounds. Perhaps to Jefferson, a quality liberal arts education and slavery were not actually competing ideas. Instead, what allowed students to fully explore the curriculum that Jefferson and the Board of Visitors designed and supported were those enslaved people. And in some ways, the educational structure that Jefferson devised reinforced for students the ideas about slavery. Students would be learning about mastery, an essential component to maintaining their interest in slavery and slaveholding, and dominance over enslaved people during their time at UVA. And this occurred through their interactions with the enslaved men and women who worked there. So with this education in mind, the first 40 students enrolled in March 1825. They were taught by nine professors and they were surrounded by enslaved women and men who are responsible for maintaining the grounds on which they lived. The enslaved laborers were witnessing the growth of liberal arts education in Virginia while living under a system of forced bondage, a system which stripped them of the opportunity to earn anything close to a similar education. Jefferson designed the university to be, again, a small and exclusive community with faculty and tutors living on campus to create this insular feeling for students. But the people who created that feeling of community and brotherhood were the enslaved laborers who ensured that the university functioned as the academical village that Jefferson designed it to be. And while students and faculty dove into their studies, into courses, again, on moral philosophy and the natural sciences, enslaved people were forced to fill their days with hard work and manual labor. Between 1825 and 1865, there were over 100 enslaved people working on grounds on any given day. However, interestingly enough, the university only owned a handful of slaves. In 1819, for example, the university purchased one bonds person, one slave, for $125. Over the next 13 years, the university purchased four more slaves. This means that most of the enslaved laborers on grounds were either hired by the university or owned by members of the faculty or the hotel keepers. The enslaved laborers who were hired, again, were owned by slaveholders who lived in close proximity to the university. Enslaved laborers ultimately took on a variety of roles as archeologist Benjamin Ford and UVA architectural historian Lewis Nelson have examined, enslaved men and women were under constant pressure to complete a wide variety of daily labor assignments. They tended to livestock, clean classrooms and labs, maintain the libraries, and in general, maintain the grounds. They cooked food, did loads of laundry, and worked in gardens. They were also responsible for gathering wood and maintaining fires on ground. In one instance, on March 3rd, 1836, the university proctor complained about students running out of wood. The chairman of the faculty recommended that the university hire more slaves and pay their enslavers more in wages to cut and deliver more wood to students in a more efficient manner. In general, enslaved laborers served the ever-evolving needs of the university students, faculty, and administrators from before the sun came up to well after the sun went down. To ensure the strict division between the enslaved laborers and members of the students and faculty, the Board of Visitors imposed strict regulations meant to restrict inappropriate interactions, especially between students and the enslaved laborers. This began with restricting students from bringing their own slaves to grounds. Though faculty were allowed to own enslaved people, and so were the, house, uh, the hotel keepers, and many did, students were strictly prohibited from, from bringing their own slaves to campus. The Board of Visitors decided in October 1824, five months before the university welcomed its first class of students, that in general, students could not bring slaves with them. And this is what they wrote. No student shall, within the precincts of the university, 
Introduce, keep, or use any spiritus or venous liquor. Keep or use weapons or arms of any kind. Or gunpowder, keep a servant, horse, or dog. Interestingly, enslaved people were categorized with other forms of chattel property. But it is worth asking, why was this the case? Why were students not allowed to bring their slaves to campus, to grounds? Jefferson's ideas about slaveholding and mastery are actually very useful here. And this is where the complexity of Jefferson's own perspective on the topic comes into play. In Notes on the State of Virginia, published in 1785, Jefferson wrote this. He wrote, there must doubtless be an unhappy influence on the manners of our people produced by the existence of slavery among us. The whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting despotism on the one part and degrading submission on the other. Our children see this and learn to imitate it. So what does this mean? In the passage, Jefferson is essentially recognizing that slavery and mastery ultimately destroys the character of slaveholders. The institution, and specifically the interactions between enslavers and the enslaved, brings out the worst parts of human nature, in particular greed, laziness, and hedonism. He was recognizing the dangerous influence of slavery, not necessarily on the enslaved, but certainly on the enslaver. And so he was perhaps attempting to avoid encouraging such behavior in UVA students. Jefferson died in 1826, so he never got to see how his grand plan worked in practice and how it evolved through the antebellum period, especially the influence of slavery and the experiences of the enslaved. In October 1840, the Board of Visitors expanded on the rule that forbade students from bringing slaves on ground. Even students who lived off campus were, from, were forbidden from bringing slaves with them. This shows Jefferson's influence even after his death. But just because students could not bring slaves with them to grounds does not mean that they did not interact with enslaved laborers, of course, because enslaved people were doing the cooking and cleaning for them. The students did, however, bring their ideas about mastery and sometimes their ideas about violence against slaves with them when they arrived to grounds. Enslaved people had a complex re relationship with the students, administrators, and faculty. From enslaved laborers facing physical assaults from students to coming to terms with the fact that they had little recourse against such violence, enslaved laborers attempted to find ways to weather the assaults of both students and faculty. On the evening of February 4th, 1830, for example, an enslaved woman was assaulted by student Thomas Tucker. He broke into the home of her enslaver and UVA faculty member, Dr. Robert Pat Patterson, and he pursued her. Though no information is given about the extent of the assault, Patterson wrote in a letter to the chairman of the faculty in which he complained quote, very much of the outrage, unquote. So while Patterson may have expressed concern about the enslaved woman's well-being, he may have also written the letter because a student assaulted his property, which may have hindered her ability in his mind to complete work productively. Though the enslaved woman whose name was never revealed in the archival record may have been suffering with the emotional trauma of the assault, she may have wondered about the steps that her enslaver would take to ensure her protection. The enslaved woman received her answer. After the assault, to which Tucker confessed, he, quote, expressed great contrition for the affair, especially as regarded the violence done to, to the feelings of Dr. Patterson and family. He did not fully come to terms with his assault, at least not publicly. Notice that Tucker did not apologize to the enslaved woman, nor was he punished for his so-called pursuit of her. 
Though Tucker received a stern lecture from the faculty chairman, the chairman remarked that Tucker did not seem to be much impressed with the immorality of his conduct. And so the chairman was not convinced that Tucker would fully atone for his assault. Tucker did not receive further punishment because the chairman wanted to, quote, save him from exposure, end quote, presumably to preserve Tucker's reputation on grounds. Some forms of violence were more public. In March 1828, one of the enslaved laborers employed by hotel keeper Warner Minor was struck by a student, Thomas Boyd, in one of the dining rooms. In September 1839, a student threw a knife at an enslaved person who was a dining room servant for insubordination. This happened again in April 1861 when student James Buford hit the enslaved laborer who belonged to one of the hotel keepers. Other forms of violence were more private and more disturbing. One of the more gruesome of the events involved an enslaved teenage girl. On April 22, 1850, between 11 p.m. and midnight, an enslaved girl whose name was not revealed in the archival record was sexually assaulted by three students, George Hardy, Armistead Eliason, and James Montandon. According to the faculty report, they were found in the act of perpetuating the crime by several other students who interfered to prevent it. Upon hearing news of this horrific event, the three students were immediately expelled and removed from grounds. Though we know what happened to the three students, we know nothing about what came of the enslaved girl. Was she forced to remain enslaved at the university? Did she seek comfort and perhaps limited protection from other enslaved people? The archival record, again, does not reveal these important details. Despite the specter of violence, some enslaved people used their position within the university to their advantage. There were recorded instances of enslaved people receiving instruction. On one occasion, on June 25th, 1833, it was reported that a group of enslaved boys were playing the violin so loudly and so frequently that student Archibald Carey had a hard time studying. Carey believed that the boys were receiving illegal violin lessons. Though, of course, it would have been illegal to teach an enslaved person how to read, write, and maybe how to play music, enslaved people always found ways to skirt the law. And enslaved individuals took advantage of the strict reg regulations that structured students' lives on grounds for their own benefit. Interestingly enough, there was a vibrant, albeit an illicit, underground trade between students and enslaved laborers. Specifically, enslaved people used the restrictions on alcohol in particular and other illicit goods to their advantage. In February 1837, one of the hotel keepers of Edwin Conway, the keeper of Hotel A, was caught smuggling two bottles into the university. This enslaved laborer was caught smuggling rum and whiskey, apparently two goods that students really wanted to acquire. The chairman of the faculty wrote this, quote, I have no doubt that the rum at least, and most probably the whiskey also, were for the students. It is possible that the enslaved person who brought the liquor into the university may have received the a bit of money on the side for his or her illicit service. Enslaved people found ways to obtain goods that they wanted, and liquor was certainly one item on the list. Perhaps they sought out alcohol to dull the traumas of their daily interactions with students, faculty, and administrators, and took advantage of students' want for this illicit good. On Sunday, November 8, 1829, a group of bonds people got drunk enough so that one of them, the bell ringer, missed his evening duties which was to ring the bell that began evening church services. A professor wrote that grounds had been, quote, infested with drunken Negroes. To control enslaved laborers, a slave patrol was established shortly thereafter on December 18, 1829. 
The chairman consulted the proctor about the necessary steps to be taken for establishing a patrol to prevent stray Negroes from committing deprivations on the premises during the Christmas holiday. The proctor said he would take the necessary steps. This is what the chairman wrote. Slave patrols in particular were a visible part of slaveholding communities in the American South writ large. Virginia introduced slave patrols in 1727. And slave patrols like the one established at UVA are a precursor to the violent and often the fraught relationship between police forces and African Americans today. In particular, historian Sally Haddon argues that the Ku Klux Klan adopted its surveillance strategies and their use of racial violence against African Americans from the tactics deployed by slave patrols in the slaveholding South, similar to the slave patrols created at the University of Virginia and in Charlottesville. As the enslaved laborers experienced higher and higher levels of surveillance, their lives were shaped by a practice that had become fairly common in antebellum Virginia, and that practice was slave hiring. Slave hiring was omnipresent at University of Virginia in particular, and in Virginia at large. The practice of slave hiring was the renting of enslaved men and women from their enslavers, allowing an institution like the university to take on as many or as few enslaved laborers as they needed. And university administrators, including Jefferson, encouraged the hiring of slaves instead of purchasing them. But what did this practice mean in the daily lives of enslaved people? Slave hiring was often a double-edged sword for the enslaved. Often hired slaved, slaves worked as skilled laborers, such as brick masons or blacksmiths. This meant that they could sometimes negotiate the terms of their hire or even the terms and amount of their payment. But in many instances, hired slaves experienced even more isolation, being taken away from their families and their communities for often months, sometimes years at a time. And because the majority of the enslaved laborers at UVA were hired, not owned by the university, these realities shaped their lives and their experiences. Historian John Zaborny, in his study of slave hiring practices in antebellum Virginia, contends that hired slaves either enjoyed tremendous levels of autonomy or they suffered from ruthless exploitation. The experiences of the hired enslaved laborers at UVA probably fit into both camps. So in conclusion, as we celebrate the completion of the memorial to the enslaved laborers that you see here and all that it stands for, let's take some time to reflect on the many names that we don't know, the enslaved laborers whose identities we may never uncover. Though we may never fully understand the scope of their experiences working at the university, let's not let their contributions go in vain. Let's keep this history alive, let's keep it vibrant, and let's gain a deeper appreciation for the incredible sacrifices that they made there are online tools that you'll see here. In particular, the Jefferson's University, the early life website, also called Jewel, is a wonderful treasure trove of first person accounts and information of these first 40 years of UVA's existence. Especially in this moment of social distancing, I encourage you to check out these online sources and become familiar with them to gain a deeper and a more broader appreciation for the experiences of the almost 4,000 enslaved laborers who helped build the University of Virginia. Thank you. Justine, um, thank you very much. This is such an important topic and, and one that's been ignored for far too long is one of the reasons why it's so important that you and others are studying it. When you visit the extraordinary lawn at UVA, this World Heritage Site and the, the fabulous architecture, and, and you think about what the University of Virginia not only was, but has become as a world-class educational facility, um, we don't want people to forget the people who actually 
physically built that architectural wonder and who actually made it work uh, in those early years. So we've had the opportunity to gather a number of questions from the people registered for the program today. And I'd like to, if you have the opportunity to uh, answer some of their questions. That'd be wonderful. Some of the questions were about the memorial to enslaved laborers. Uh, one of our registrants asked, I noticed there are often just first names or even a dash where a name would go on the memorial that UVA recently constructed to honor these slaves. Can you explain why that is the case? Sure. Well, in terms of the names that are act actually on the memorial, um, the researchers, the students, the historians who did the archival research um, only found about 600 names. The dashes represent not only slashes of a lash or a whip, but they represent the other enslaved laborers whose uh, labor and work and dedication went to uh, building UVA. And too, it gives us a, a chance to um, do this further research and in the future, etch those names into the memorial when we find them. And you had mentioned that uh, approximately 4,000, we know of um, approximately 4,000 enslaved people who worked at the University of Virginia before emancipation. Um, there obviously are, are thousands of descendants. Have they been involved, have the African American community been involved in the work on the memorial? They were certainly consulted. And again, this was a student-driven mission to have the university publicly recognize these very important laborers to building UVA. And there was supposed to be an official opening of the memorial in the spring, but because of COVID and the pandemic that has been postponed. But the university is planning a larger ce celebration bringing these uh, important, the families of these contributors to grounds to publicly celebrate the opening of the memorial. If you, for our viewers, if you've had a chance to look at the virtual tour of the memorial to enslaved laborers, uh, one of the things that's mentioned is there is going to be an opportunity of some of the descendants to join in the official dedication. So something to look forward mm -hmm. to in the, in the future. It's very important for us. Well, now let's turn a little bit to the people who were here at UVA and working. Um, one of our guests asked, where did enslaved persons live while working at the university? So enslaved laborers lived in the hotels, but there were uh, walls constructed to separate the enslaved laborers from the faculty and the students. They were called serpentine walls. And so the in, enslaved laborers were meant to be seen when necessary and unseen when not necessary. And so interestingly enough, they were, they lived in some of these, these buildings, but they were strategically kept and separated from faculty and students. And we were asked about their lives. I mean, what did they do uh, when they weren't working for the university and, sure. and on some of their own time? Sure. Well, the, the idea of, uh, of an enslaved person's own time or free time is complicated. Um, of course, uh, enslaved men and women had families. They were members of important communities. And so often in their free time, they were spending time with family, if not engaged in the types of activities that would benefit themselves. It was not uncommon for enslaved men and women to keep gardens, to uh, develop a skill so that they could use sometimes to make money on, on their own. And so interestingly enough, even the idea of free time is complicated for an enslaved man or an enslaved woman because it was often work done for, for themselves. They rarely had leisure time. Well, and, and it's important to remember as, as your talk mm -hmm. highlighted that even in, in what you might call free time, there, there's an omnipresent violence and, mm -hmm. and, and repression that's going on, these, these cases of assault and attack. Mm -hmm. And, and as, you know, so it's, um, it's very difficult sure. uh, for these people as they were attempting to, to live their lives in those mm -hmm. circumstances. Um, one of our guests asked, were the enslaved laborers owned by the university or were their services rented from others? And did the students, uh, and I know you talked about this, bring their own enslaved with them to grounds? And if so, did they live beneath the lawn rooms? Sure. 
Well, I will take the uh, one of the uh, last questions first. Um, no, uh, students were not allowed to bring slaves with them to grounds, and Jefferson was pretty explicit about that. Um, he wanted the students to have an educational experience that was free in some way from, um, from this idea of mastery, right? He wanted them to focus on their studies. Um, interestingly enough, though, um, students had daily interactions with slave people, and so they were constantly practicing um, how to interact with slaves or this idea of mastery. Um, and so it is interesting that, again, even though um, students could not have slaves, they were constantly surrounded by the, um, by the experience of being an enslaver in some way because they were served by, they were catered to in many ways by enslaved men and women. Excellent. Um, one of the things that you touched upon, but one of our guests asked, and maybe you can give us a little bit more uh, what historians like to refer to as periodization, how th sure. this changes over time, mm -hmm. uh, is was it illegal in Virginia at the time to teach slaves to read or write? And, and how critical was that ability to read or write to uh, the enslaved people? Sure, yes, it was illegal. Um, and the privilege of being able to read and write was highly valued among enslaved men and women. Isabella Gibbons is a perfect example, right? One of the first things that she does at the end of the war in 1865 was she joins the Freedmen School in Charlottesville to teach other members of Charlottesville's African-American community how to read and write. And so um, literacy was increasingly important in, uh, in Charlottesville in Virginia, and it becomes increasingly uh, problematic too um, in the 19th century as there are more and more uh, slave uprisings. Um, and so this idea of, of, of an in enslaved person who knew how to read and write was seen as a threat. The, the, the relationship to the uprisings is something that people should understand. Sure. The, the, the people who uh, not only owned enslaved people, but, but also the white community generally was terrified of these slave uprisings. And so it's after Gabriel's rebellion in 1800 that we start to see restrictions on the gathering to learn. African-American yes. slaves were not allowed to gather to learn. Mm -hmm. And Nat Turner's rebellion in I think it's 1831. 1831, 31 yes. is 30 or 31. Mm -hmm. 1831, you start to see fines being imposed if people sure. are educating enslaved people. Um, so, uh, you know, masters would sometimes, Jefferson uh, had enslaved people who were educated and able to read or write mm -hmm. in his time period, but these rebellions really caused a lot of these restrictions to tighten. And, and too, if we talk about uh, Jefferson as well, um, one of the, uh, the, the highlights of kind of slavery in the U.S. and then really slavery in, in the Atlantic world more broadly was the rebellion in Saint-Domingue, the Haitian yes. Revolution. Um, Jefferson writes about how uh, on the, the one hand it's terrifying, but on the, the other hand, I'm not sure if he's all that surprised that um, that slaves would uh, would stage a massive, massive, and ultimately a successful rebellion. That was a constant fear, not only of Jefferson but of slave masters writ large. They were afraid of slaves um, uh, in their violence. I, I want to come back to this issue of fear because you mm -hmm. say it, it really. To, to try to understand, it's such a difficult institution to understand and to understand the mm -hmm. people, but fear is really a critical piece of that. And I want to come back to that in maybe our last question. Um, but before I do that, maybe I'll just ask you to, to, to give us some of your own thoughts. A lot of schools uh, like the University of Virginia are mm -hmm. grappling with this question now of the role of slavery in the building of the school, the financial role of slavery, the role of the enslaved laborers. Um, how should the university educate its students on this? What do you think uh, we ought to be doing? 
Well, I think that this is a wonderful step in the right direction for universities in particular, but institutions writ large to begin to grapple with their complex histories. And for many universities, University of Virginia being one, the history of slavery is so important to its founding and to the experiences of students, especially in the 19th century. And so, um, and so I think that UVA is on the right track. I think that students, when they decide to enroll and matriculate at these types of in institutions and universities, I think it is important that they understand this deep, complex history that in some way might explain the conversations that we are having now about racial justice. It is, uh, you know, if it, you can't understand what's happening now if you don't understand some of this history, which of course Jefferson uh, was famous about saying that over and over again. We need to study our history if we want to understand how our country works now. Well, I, you know, I have several questions that maybe we'll sort of wrap up on, but I think it's going to be a discussion that may, we may go back and forth on a little sure. bit. We were talking about fear. And this fear is not only omnipresent in, in the white community at the time, but it's clearly a critical issue for Jefferson. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about uh, this fear. There's going to be a race war. Uh, he, he, he recognizes that slavery is wrong. It's evil. It's, it's, it's a terrible institution. He recognizes it will end. He says it's inevitable. It must end. It will end. But he's obviously very concerned that if it ends, there's going to be a race war because the blacks are going to seek retribution, justified mm -hmm. retribution for what's been done to them. He, he, he recognizes uh, the terrible things that have been done to them. So this, this fear becomes part of, um, you know, what do you do? It's the, mm -hmm. the, the famous quote where Jefferson says slavery is like having a wolf by the ears. Mm -hmm. You're afraid to hold on. You're afraid to let go. Um, but one of our viewers had asked, how do you think Thomas Jefferson reconciled in his own mind, or perhaps on paper, the huge disconnect between owning slaves and writing all men are created equal? What logic, flawed as it might be, uh, did he use that allowed himself to live with that contradiction? Sure. And that is probably the question that is at the heart of, I'll say attempting to understand Jefferson as a person and as a historical figure. I think that Jefferson as reflected in his writings and it certainly in his correspondence with his friends and colleagues um, was grappling with his ownership of slaves while espousing these lofty ideals about democracy and freedom. I, I believe that he felt so tethered probably to uh, slavery and slaveholding as an economic institution, as a way to uh, build and pass along wealth, that I, I wonder if he had a hard time disentangling himself. Of course, pe people that he knew certainly did, certainly um, divested them themselves of slavery and their slaves, freeing their slaves for a variety of reasons. And it seems to me that Jefferson was pro probably grappling with that until the very end of his life. Um, we know that he had um, various types of re relationships with the bondsmen and bondswomen that he, he owned. Um, and that gives us a bit of context as to how he thought about the institution of slavery. But he probably grappled with this question until the end of his life, finding it difficult to disentangle himself from the institution of slavery. Well, this is an issue which, of course, we deal with daily here at Monticello. We try to grapple with it very, uh, you know, forcefully and out front because over his life, Jefferson owned 607 enslaved people. Mm -hmm. Over 400 worked here at Monticello, the others in other locations. And as you say, or you implied, he frees very few. He mostly frees his children, mm -hmm. uh, who he had with Sally Hemings. Um, and, and so he's, he's grappling uh, with this inconsistency. And throughout his life, he recognizes that slavery is wrong and must end. He never, he never deviates from that. But yet, and especially in his older years, he seems to say, it's the next generation's mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the next generation needs to be the one 
solving all of this. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, are we still grappling with his punting of that issue? I, I believe that we uh, we are. Um, this this question of um, of how long it took for slavery to end and the means by which it finally ended is and in our important questions. Um, in addition to not just slavery, but the role of pe people of African descent in American society. Um, this is a question that we are, we as, as, as citizens are continuing to grapple with. And so um, in, in many ways, this is a legacy of some of the, the choices that men such as Jefferson made in not fully grappling with this, with this question of slavery and thereby this question of race. Well, it, it, it is so important, and, and you allude to the timing. Uh, this has become popular on social media. We need to remember the timing. You know, slavery mm -hmm. starts in America in 1619. It's, mm -hmm. it's not illegal to 1865, mm -hmm. and we have 100 years of Jim Crow, exactly. and then another 20 or 30 years of grappling with the civil rights implications. So it's not surprising that we mm -hmm. continue to grapple with this issue today. But Justine, thank you so much. You, We're John. so glad you could join us. Uh, we also want to make sure we, we thank Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement at the University of Virginia, which co-sponsored today's talk. And we want to invite all of you to return next week for our live streams about Lewis and Clark. Here we are in Mon Alto at the University at Monticello, excuse me. And we want to hope that you all have a great afternoon. Thank you.